Here's a typical mini mill. It's branded Cummins and came from one of those traveling tool shows many years ago. It has a two-speed gearbox, the gears are plastic, and they're broken. So, I'm going to walk through the steps to disassemble the gearbox and replace the plastic broken gears with some much better steel gears. Although not identical, most of these SIG X2 mini mills from outfits like Grizzly and Harbor Freight are similar and sure look like they came from the same place. They generally have a Morse taper spindle or an R8 spindle. This one has an R8 spindle. It uses R8 collets like this. First off is this head counterbalance arm. I'll hold it to take the pressure off while the bolt is removed from the torsion spring support. The cover screws are removed. Inside, more screws hold the electric box to the casting. The screws holding the cover on can go back in so they don't get away. A 5mm hex wrench is used to remove the bolts holding the motor on. The motor and switch are still attached by the wires but can be moved out of the way. I'll get the stop out of the way and off with the head. The head casting is made in two pieces. This is the gear that runs it up and down. The fine adjustment needs to be removed from the part of the casting with the gears. Two screws hold the cover on. Two more screws hold the bracket for the fine adjustment shaft. This is the bracket that holds the clear chip guard. I'll get that out of the way next. Four large bolts hold the two halves of the casting together. I dropped the socket in and it won't fall out, so I'm using a different wrench now. All four bolts are the same size. Now it's easy to see the condition of the gears. Not good. Crack and missing teeth. Off comes the driven gear on the idler shaft. It has a keyway and it's held to the idler shaft with a screw.
The chuck is held by an R8 collet and a drawbar. I probably should have removed that in an earlier step to have less weight to lift off, but it's not that heavy anyway. These bearing cover plates come off next. They're held on with three screws. There's another just like it on the top. They appear to be identical, but I'm labeling them top and bottom anyway. It's just a good idea to put things back like you found them. Under the set screw is a spring and a ball to hold the sliding gear in either the high or low speed setting. Then the screw that holds the shifter arm to the shaft is removed. The shifter arm holds the shift fork that moves the sliding gear from high to low settings. handle and shifter assembly is put back like it was to keep it straight and put aside for now. Next the snap ring comes off the idler shaft. Here you can see it's starting to move and the bearing is coming with it. I'm using a wooden mallet, then a center punch once it's down to the bearing. It's only held by the broken sliding gear now, so a gentle tug and it's out. <clears throat> the shaft is out, the gear is out, and uh, the gear, of course, is the focus of all this. It's shot. You can see it's missing teeth. Here you can see the larger low speed gear on the spindle is missing some teeth. But this is how things are oriented. No threads are exposed on the end. You can only see them through the set screw. Looking closely you can see these are left handed threads.
With the nut out of the way, there's a sleeve that comes right off with just a little persuasion from a screwdriver. It's a keyed sleeve. And now the key is out. The spindle won't move with a mallet. A shot press is needed for that. Properly supported, lined up straight with a piece of wood to protect the end of the shaft. Okay, we can see here is the top side. It slid in a little bit. And on the other end we can see it's the bearing. It's coming out of the housing. I'll make sure there's clearance for the bearings so they don't hit the support plate. pretty easy now. And there it is. Here's the old gears. Note I've marked them with a sharpie marker to capture how it all goes together. Here's what it looks like with everything out. To the left is the bottom side of the machine and this is how the spindle goes. That big bearing on the bottom and then the big gear. There's a spacer. There's the little gear and another spacer. Note how the keys are mushroomed a little. It looks like someone at the factory used a big hammer or a whole bunch of enthusiasm to get it to go together. Here's the old plastic gears on the left and the new steel gears on the right. This one's missing a couple teeth. Okay, so then following along here from right to left, there's the spacer that never left the shaft. There is the big gear. There is another spacer. There's the little gear. And there's one more spacer after that. Although the gears can be removed without taking out the top bearing, there's no way it's going back together with that in there. So it's back to the press with a bearing driver. It's coming right out. And out comes the topside bearing. It landed safely in the ice cream bucket. The sound of something hitting the concrete was the bearing driver.
This is the lower bearing on the shaft being pressed back into the casting. The big gear is on the shaft and ready to be pressed back into place. I'm using some PVC plumbing fittings that are just big enough to fit around the shaft. It's lined up with the keyway and tapped into position. Next is a spacer, it's not quite as challenging. The smaller gear is lined up with the keyway and tapped into position. Okay, we're moving ahead at a pace now. Here's where we're at. The white piece you can see at the very edge here, that's the spacer that never came off of the spindle. This is the big gear, right here. This is another spacer. And this is a little gear we just pushed on, and it is now tight against the spacer. Here's the view from the top, and there's one more spacer to go on. Next, the top bearing is pressed on. The end of the spindle is supported and the casting rests on another block with a self-adjusting shop rag to make the fit just right. A PVC coupler is used to apply force to the inner bearing race. Stop and check our progress here. Looks like the outer race is going in okay now. The double gear slides on the idler shaft. That's how you get high and low gear.
this is the bearing that stayed on the shaft and this is the one it's just starting to get into There's a hole in the 2x6 to clear the shaft. Now it's repositioned so the end of the shaft is supported so the bearing can be pressed on without the shaft moving. That black piece is from the top of the spindle where the drawbar goes in. The shaft is pressed in far enough so the groove is exposed. Okay, the snap ring goes on the bottom end of the idler shaft. There's a little groove here. The snap ring goes on the bottom of the idler shaft. There's a groove here for it. I'll set it on the shaft using a snap ring pliers, then make sure it's seated in the groove. And there it is. Here's the shifter assembly. There's a couple detents cut into the shaft that a spring-loaded ball registers in to hold it in either the high or low gear position as selected. I'll grease the pivoting part of the shift fork now. It won't be accessible after assembly. Put that on there like that. There's a detent in the end of the shaft that will secure the arm in the correct spot. I miss greasing the shaft, so I pulled it apart and greased it, then back together for good. This is low gear. The little gear turns the larger spindle gear. This is high gear. The big gear turns the smaller spindle gear. There's a screw that holds a spring against the ball. The ball registers in one of the two detents on the shaft to hold the gearbox in either low or high gear. Then inside this hole you can see a detent in the shaft that holds it in low gear and in high gear. I'll put some grease in the hole, then the ball, spring, and retaining screw. Here it is in its normal upright position in low gear and high gear. Okay, this bottom piece with the three screws goes next.
The bottom and top bearing covers are reattached with three screws each. Then the key goes in the spindle followed by the keyed sleeve and the left-handed nut. I'll tighten the nut after the motor is reattached so I'll have a way to hold it with the rod in the index hole. The gears are thoroughly greased before the two casting halves are bolted together. The mating surfaces are wiped clean and the two castings bolted together. They're held together with four bolts. and then snug them down good. Next on, the micro adjuster. Two screws hold the cover on. The column is tipped back for now to make it easier to set the head back on. Here it is back on the column. You can see how it fits on the dovetail with the gibbs. Now it's starting to look more like a mill instead of just a bunch of parts on the bench. The plastic drive gear is cleaned up with a toothbrush and reattached. This is the only plastic gear used on the machine now, so if something gives, it'll be this. We've got the gear, the key, and the screw and washer that holds it on. The key goes in the keyway, the gear slides onto the shaft and is held in place with a screw. The metal gear on the motor is lube before installing. That screw was in the way. Now I can lock the spindle and easily tighten the nut. Left hand threads and a set screw. And the electrical box goes back on. The little black bushing I used on the press goes in the top of the spindle where the drawbar goes in.
I'll make sure the spindle socket is wiped clean and reinstall the R8 tooling and drawbar. And the upper stop goes back on. This would have been a little simpler to put on if I had done it before I put the motor on. The parts for the counterbalance are reinstalled and tightened down. Two bolts hold the mount for the chip guard. If you liked the video or find it helpful, be sure to give it a thumbs up, share, and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching.